All right. My hope is that as a result of this class, we're not just making it easier for you to draw insects, but all of a sudden you are seeing insects everywhere. And the world is just a lot more fun, a lot more beautiful um, for, for you to uh, explore and discover. Um, insects are incredibly diverse, interesting, fascinating. And once you get in them, as you've, you've experienced, Right? It's just, it's wonderful. We, we put, a lot of people kind of, the, the starter critters, we, we start with birds. Right? And, you got, and we go, oh my gosh, birds are wonderful. And once you move on to bugs, the whole world of bio, if you're doing bugs, you're, you're also then, you're, you're into flowers, all these other sorts of things. You know, like come to the bug side. Once you're with the bugs, you'll be not a birder, not a botanist, you'll be an ecologist. And things just, the world opens up in some really wonderful ways. And I think you're going to love it. Um, I originally was thinking I was going to have one lecture on how to draw bugs, and the more that I got into it, I was just like, oh, it's and this, and this, and this. It's sort of exploding um, at, at, at home and on my, 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 um, my workstation. And so as, as a result, we're going to have several how to draw bug lectures. And um, uh, today, uh, and, and it's going to go uh, not in an order that makes that much sense. We're going to go with, with the order of the stuff that I have prepared for you. Um, uh, and so next month there will be some more uh, insect stuff, which will also include some real basic stuff, which, you, which probably should be in the first lecture, but that's going to be okay. We're going to give you some real basics, and um, my goal today is to, first of all, uh, help you think like an entomologist give you a little bit of systematics so that when you look at an insect, you're like, oh, you look familiar. I kind of know what you're looking at. And I know a few kind of tricky points about drawing you that uh, I should really kind of focus in on. We're going to look at the eight most common orders of insects. And what are some kind of details about those that we really want to focus in on and notice. And we also want to look at um, a few of the most common mistakes that people make in drawing insects. What is like the real low-hanging fruit, like the top uh, bug drawing goofs? We're going to fix those in all of your drawings. And um, I want to, in a number of the other classes, we've looked at you know, the structure of the insect or the, the bird and these sort of things, but kind of how you kind of get in there and draw these surface textures. None of the other workshops we've done have really included that. And the drawing insects is a perfect way and a perfect place to do that. What we're going to do at the end of this workshop um, after a step-by-step -step on how to draw a butterfly, is uh, take a look at how do you draw something so that you can make something look shiny? How do you draw something so that it looks sort of rounded but dull? And how do you draw things that are, are um, iridescent? How do you draw iridescence versus shiny things versus dull things that are still rounded? We're going to look at some of those tex surface textures. The following month, we'll add a few other textures in, how you draw the fuzzy things, how do you draw things that are uh, transparent and translucent. Um, and, uh, but we'll kind of wet our feet with that for uh, today's class. At the end of today's class, I'm gonna, you're going to go home with a bag of tricks to help you draw insects. But your brain will forget it all if you don't do something with it. So therefore, we have homework. So, um, if you're not going to do your homework, you might as well leave right now. Because your brain really won't retain that much stuff. But if you use it, it's going to stick. So here's your homework. You've got to give me seven insects. All I'm asking is seven insects. Draw seven insects, and if possible, post those on our site online to get other people excited about drawing insects. A great way to practice this is to do, you just do seven insects from uh, photographs that you can find online or in other books that you have. Next month, we'll also be doing a lot of more sort of field sketching of these insects. But start with these things that aren't going to move around, right? get yourself sort of comfortable with how do you do these, deal with these textures? How do you deal with these shapes and sorts of things? And then we can move into those moving bugs a little bit later on. Is that a deal? Seven insects, that's all I ask. You ready? Let's draw bugs. All right. Um, first, uh, we're going to go to bug school. Uh, this is Entomology 101.
and um, what we're going to do is we're going to understand the basic structure of the insect, take a close look at some of the detailed parts that confuse and scare people about drawing insects, and then introduce you to the top eight orders of insects, and a few kind of points on those to help you kind of get them right. Are you ready? Here we go. Bug School 101. The bug. All right. Here's an insect. And you've studied some insect stuff before. How many basic body segments do they have? Three body segments. Those are? Head, thorax, and abdomen. You may have run into this before. If you haven't, hey, it's the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. The head, this is the oval office. This is the decider. This is where all the decisions are being made. Big neural ganglion up here. Also, all these sensory organi organs. We have huge compound eyes, little palps, feelers in front of the mouth. We have antenna, which are little chemical detectors sticking up on top. So all of that sensory information is all packed up right there. Part du, we have the thorax. The thorax is, if this is the Oval Office, this is the Department of Transportation. All right? This is where the legs attach. This is where the wings attach. All the flight muscles, all that stuff is right here in this middle body segment. And finally, the abdomen sticking out the back side. This is the Department of Public Works. This is where everything else gets dumped. The reproductive system, the respiratory system, the circulatory system, the uh, digestive system, all that stuff is down in here in the abdomen. So you have head, thorax, and abdomen. All right. They each have their function, they each have their job. And um, probably the, when people kind of look at that, one of the scariest things about drawing, insects would be a lot easier to draw if they didn't have legs. All right. So I, look, we, like if we just had a class on drawing worms, we'd be over pretty quickly. But um, these legs, that scares people. They go like, ooh, how do you do those? If you could kind of get down one kind of like, all right, I'm going to do just a little bit of study and get this one part down and kind of learn it. This is where you have to like study your notes. If you learn the leg, you are way ahead of the game. So I'm going to kind of simplify it for you and, and sort of show you the, the insect leg in a way that you can remember. Just uh, memorize all this. No, okay. So to make it a little bit easier, we're going to focus on these three parts of the insect leg. These two little parts close to the body, on most insects, those are small, little compact things that really don't make a big difference in your drawing. These three parts of the legs, that's a big deal. And they're equivalent to thinking about a human leg. We have... This part of the leg, the bone inside here, is called my femur, and we call this the femur of the insect. We name these parts after bones that are in the human body. So the next part of the leg that's skinnier, that's my tibia, and my tarsal bones are in here. Right? This is the insect's tarsus. It's a series of small little sections, starting bigger, getting smaller, 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 smaller. Last one has little claws on the end of it. Right? This is the, the tarsus going um, out here. So you can think of this like big kind of, this is our insect knee, this is its heel. Those aren't direct equivalents to what's going on with my anatomy. But thinking of this as a human leg will help you remember it. Three sections. The last part is this flexible foot part. These two parts back here, if you are up for the challenge, you can memorize these two here. We've got the trochanter and the coxa. On most insects, this isn't going to be a big deal. But on a few, such as the wasp, hey, don't go back that far. The wasp here, look at that, see? Those two segments on the wasps are really long. So here's our femur, our tibia, and our tarsus, those one, two, three parts. There's the, you know, like the knee, the heel, the foot. And, but on the wasps, they've got those two sections, the coxa and the trochanter, are a little bit longer. So it looks like the leg has this extra bend in it. But on most insects, you're not going to really be f struggling with that. You look on a grasshopper, you just see this one, two, three parts. All right? So there's your insect leg. 
I'd say that's the hardest thing to kind of, if you, it's helpful to wrap your head around that because what a lot of people do is they just, they, when they get to drawing insects, they, they, they just kind of, we're so scared of those that we don't really look carefully at them. But once you kind of have this system in your head, you'll see this reproduced in a whole bunch of, you know, this insect, oh, I see that, I see that, I see that, I see that. And what body segment do these attach to? The thorax, the Department of Transportation. So, one of these is wrong. Which one is, is, is wrong? Right. So take a look at these. All right. Decide which one feels right to you. Which one feels the best to you? How many vote for... Uh, so, so, so one of these is going to be right. One of these is going to be wrong. How many people like this one? All right. How many people like this one? Oh, bold. Two, two people kind of tentatively raising their hands. They're like, it's hard to go against the, 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 the mass, isn't it? Right? When everybody's voting like, yeah, this looks right. Because we know these things attach in here to the thorax. Right? You are correct. Those legs attach to the thorax. The only problem is insects don't look like that. You too are actually right. <laughs> and this is number one most commonly made mistake in drawing insects. Because we know that the legs attach into the thorax, we draw them attaching into the thorax. But if we look on the underside, right, that's where we see something else. This is the first time I've used these incredibly obnoxious features, but it was just so over the top and goofy, I decided to make this thing come in and bounce. So, sorry about that. Um, made me happy. Um, but check this out. Let's look at, at, at a beetle with a split personality. You're seeing the top and the bottom of it. And what I've done is the, the thorax of this thing I have shaded in orange. Ooh, there's this extension of the thorax down onto the underside of the body here where the legs are coming in. And that's what confuses everybody, is that what we see here, one, two, three, oh, this is clear, is actually a little bit more complex when you look on the underside. So if you just remember to actually, when you look at your insect, don't expect them all to come out here and say, actually, I'm going to look at where your legs are really coming out that will fix your insect legs. So just believe the insect. If you're drawing an insect, there's going to be a little bug in front of you, believe the insect. All right? So now let's take a look at how these legs attach in eight different orders of insects. And you are already familiar with a bunch of these basic orders of insects. When you think of big groups of insects that you know, you're probably thinking about insect orders. So what are some big groups of insects that you know? Beetles, beetles exactly. Beetles are one. Beetles is an insect order. What else? Flies. flies. Good. Flies are another. So um, spiders are in a whole different group. So spiders, with the insects, you have, you've got a head, you have a thorax, and you have an abdomen. In the spiders, you're going to take that head and that thorax and combine them into one segment, and then have an abdomen. You're going to have three legs coming out of the thorax of the insect, and you have four legs coming out of the cephalothorax of the spider. So they're, they're, they're non-insects. Um, and we'll do a little bit with spiders next month. But things like flies, things like the butterflies, things like the beetles, when we think of those big groups of insects that we know, we're talking insect orders. So let's take a, let's gallop through the top eight insect orders and a few uh, drawing tricks that will help us get those ones most accurately. We're going to start with the one that you mentioned. So uh, Ringo, John, um, and... <laughs> Uh, the beetles. Um, so this is a beetle, and how do I know it's a beetle? So hard, hard shell. All insects have uh, a, 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 a an exoskeleton. Many of them have this sort of tough 
um, keratinized um, exoskeleton, and the hard shell of the beetle has on the back side here these two wing covers meet together making a straight line right down the back. So when you see this straight line, think beetle. Right. Think of a, a ladybug. You've seen a ladybug? The ladybug has a straight line down the middle of the back and then it goes to fly and these two wing covers pop up, membranous wings flick out underneath them and it goes flying away. But it comes to a straight line down right the middle of the back. You see that, you have a beetle. In some beetles, these two wing the beetle has given up flight for better protection, and these fuse together, making one hard shell. But you often can sort of see the little hint of that ancient seam that is, is between them when you look really, really carefully. A couple of things to look for in beetles. Um, I'll kind of go into my step-by-step -step on drawing one of these next month, but just a little preview. I don't start drawing the head, then the thorax, and the abdomen. I start with kind of getting the overall shape, how wide and how long is this whole thing together. Then out of that, I'm thinking how much of that is these wing covers, how much of that is the thorax, how much of that is the head. This gives you kind of more of a unified bug look. When you draw it with the head, then the thorax and the abdomen, you often get into these, each of these sections so much that the proportions of the overall thing kind of get a little bit goofy. In the thorax here, take a close look at the shape of it. In some of them, it will be wine glass shaped, wider or bowl shaped, wider at the top, narrower at the bottom. In others, it's going to be narrower at the top, wider in the bottom. So, you're going to see a lot of variation there. Another very useful thing to pay attention to is the shape of the antenna. Some have little short ones, some have very long ones, some have ones with clubs at the end, some have ones with little flips coming off of them. There's lots of different ways of doing that. So initially getting the proportions of this thing, getting the shape of that thorax, getting the details of these antenna. That makes a big difference. I should also probably say that the number of sections here in the, in the tarsus, that will actually change in different families of beetles and different little groups of insects. So there isn't one number to memorize. If it's so small that you can't see it on your insect, you don't have to draw it. All right. If you can see it, you can count them. But know that that is something, uh, that is a place where change can happen. Um, going to erase these little guys. Pull of some beetles. Look at the what you can get with antenna. Right. Real interesting variety of antenna shapes, sizes. Look at variations in thorax shape. The beetles. The next is bugs. And bugs, uh, we sometimes use bugs to mean, as a kind of common term, meaning insects. But to an entomologist, bugs mean something very specific. It means a spe one order of insects. The bugs um, have, actually, let me go back to this beetle here for a second. You see this little tab here right between those wings? If you took that and made that really big, and then on the wing cover had half of that being hard for protection and half of that being a membrane, you'd have a bug on your hands. Um, so that change, that's doo -doo -doo, is what gives us a bug. So here's that large triangular piece on the back the wing being half hard, half membrane. So the, the names of these, the, the names of these orders that scientists use are actually often have kind of interesting stories behind them. Hemi, half, terra, winged. This is half winged. So here we have those legs coming out. These two appear to be coming out from under here. This one appears to be coming out from underneath the thorax, but there would be an extension of this um, thorax down on the underside. Let's take a look at some bugs. Oh, for you Star Wars fans out there, these pattern on the back, 
All right, makes it X on the back. So these are the X wings. All right, so um, so here's without the big red X. See that X on the back? See if you can see that X on the back of some of these. Um, so these are these do suck uh, plant juices. The weevils are actually a kind of beetle. The beetles are really uh, weevils are a fun beetle that have a little, there's a little beevil, be, weevil head. They have a little snout, and their antennae actually come out from their snout like that. Um, they're on these little elbowed things. They're, they're, the weevils are a kind of beetle. Um, so these are stink bugs. <laughs> Yes. So, yeah. And uh, so they can secrete foul-smelling stuff that uh, makes you not want to eat them, should you already be inclined to do that. But they do lots of, these are, are plant eaters. This one's a predator, the assassin bug, right? And they've got a little short beak that they use to and grab other little insects with. These ones have a long beak that they stick into plants. They're pretty cool. Yes. Um, um, is, are the other um, the, 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 the real bugs and the other bugs are the no, are not the real bugs? Are the other bugs classified as real bugs? Good question. So the whole bug term gives us a lot of confusion. When people say bugs, you have to kind of look at who's saying it. If it's somebody who doesn't know entomology and insects, they're probably just saying mm, this thing with legs. Right? Kind of is a bug. Right? So when they're talking to an entomologist, they're talking hemiptera when they say the bugs. Um, so sometimes they'll say true bugs to say, like, you know, if I'm going to use the term bugs, I mean the bug bugs. But entomologists don't use the term bugs for other things, things other than the hemiptera. Yeah, great question. So the next one, this is another group you're already familiar with. These have sort of membrane wings that are covered with scales. So those are the butterflies. These are the moths. Right? And butterflies tend to have bright colors, fly during the day. Um, they fold their wings up over their back when they're at rest, in this position here. Um, and their antenna come to these little clubs. So they've got an antenna it is shaped like a little club. Moths, on the other hand, are the opposite. They have tend to have dull colors. They tend to come out at night. They tend to hold their wings flat down like this so that they can um, blend in with tree bark and not stick up and be noticed. Um, and their antenna are either these little filaments like this. And, and other want moths, you'll see they have these sort of feathery antenna like that. When you see that, that tells you that you have a male. This big feathery antenna are to, to, to connect, catch the pheromones of the, the male. The females tend to have these more um, one little uh, strand. So it's fun to, if you, howdy. Um, you can see, you can, uh, on the same species, you can find some with big poofy ones, some with little thin ones. That helps you tell male from female moths. Looking at the number of legs is one place that people get into trouble with their uh, butterfly drawings uh, because we all know there should be six legs there. But one of the most common groups of brightly colored, spectacular, beautiful butterflies, the nymphalid butterflies, um, have their front legs are these tiny little uh, brushes that are in front of their body. And they don't show up. When you're looking at it, it just looks like it has, you've got an, a, a butterfly that is sitting there and it has, it's standing on four legs like a table. And so, uh, but, but on, I've seen on many drawings, people will draw those butterflies with six legs because they know it's supposed to have six. And they're looking at perhaps some photographic reference or a specimen, they say, oh, the others must have fallen off, right? Because um, it's got to have, I mean, no, it's got to have, have, have six. Um, 
The veining patterns on butterflies is also fairly specific. This is your basic pattern that you are going to see on butterfly wings. And you don't have to um, memorize, oh, it's going to come up and then it's going to turn this way. If you just basically remember that on the wing, you're going to have some sort of a cell with veins coming off of that, you're doing great. All right, so you see that in the front wing and the hind wing. So there's one central cell and the veins come off of that. On many butterflies, you're not going to be able to see the veins, so you don't have to worry about it at all. But if you can see the veins, this is what you should expect them to be doing. Kind of take a close look at your butterfly wing, and you'll see like, oh, yeah, yeah, this is, what, uh, this is what is going on here. So look for that central cell with veins rolling off of it. Very often, if there are repeated patterns, like spots on the wing, those can often happen right there in the margins between these. Or you'll find lines curving in patterns on the wing that are echoing what is going on with those veins. That's why they're kind of useful. These wings fold up over each other when the butterfly is at rest. So you've got the hind wing and the upper wing. When the butterfly folds its wings over its back, you can see all of the hind wing and the front wing tucks in behind it. So if I were to draw this, here would be my kind of quick sketch with my non-photo blue pencil. I would say roughly you've got a triangle of a wing. Here is your hind wing. Great way to get started with a butterfly drawing. Then I'm going to refine my upper wing just a little bit more. There we go. And there's my little insect. So I can see all of that hind wing overlapping the front wing. One other kind of cool feature that uh, butterflies have is a little curly tongue. You sometimes see that all rolled up right underneath their head. This little palp that's right in front of the eye is also distinctive. So kind of a quick and dirty butterfly head. There's a little palp right here in front. The antenna are going to come off. And the, um, sometimes you can see their tongue rolled up down below it. You don't always see that. But that little eyeball, big eyeball with a palp, quick and dirty butterfly head. Here's a butterfly perched. You can see all of that hind wing. When these butterflies land, they often will sit with their wings open for a little while. So now my question is, which of these two spread open winged positions is correct? I got you on the last one. So this is most common mistake in drawing butterflies, part two or drawing insects part two. You see this, this next mistake happens all the time. Um, you've got your butterfly sitting on the flower out there. Does this one look better or this one? Raise your hand if you like this one. Raise your hand if you like this one. Okay, only one brave person went for this one. And this time... Okay. So what's, what's going on here? This looks really familiar to us, though, right? I've seen this before. Where have I seen this before? Where have you seen this before? Drawing, drawing. Tons of drawings. <laughs> yes, say that louder. Pinned specimens. So pin specimens. This is the way that when an entomologist catches the butterfly in their net, they put it in a little wing jar, they then put a pin through the back, they pull the wings up, hold them in place with pins to dry them so that in the dried specimen you don't have these wings covering up what these wings are doing. So you can see all of the wing surfaces. And then they put them in the insect display cases. So sometimes when an illustrator gets the pinned specimen to draw, they will go like, ah, oh, I'm drawing this, I want to draw this, this butterfly on a flower. They put it in this position because that's what it's doing on, with, on the pin there. And they're drawing the pinned insect on top of 
right? But typically, the wings are going to be down lower, closer to the head level of the butterfly. They can do this, right? But typically, they're going to be doing something much closer to this. With a good portion of that hind wing may be obscured behind that forewing. The amount of body that you get to see in between here is going to just depend on, on where it's holding its wings. Sometimes you see the insect's body in between these two lower wings. Sometimes they will completely cover it up. Um, boom. I really need to stay away from you know, PowerPoint effects. Um, <laughs> So a useful, because they hold their, their wings down sort of at head level, a useful kind of starter in drawing insects is to think of the, uh, the butterfly, is to think of the whole butterfly as a triangle. Is it a long-winged, long triangle? Or if butterflies with shorter wings, is that sort of a deeper triangle? This is a great way to initially assess the <coughs> proportions of the butterfly that you're looking at. Are you looking at some really cool tropical long-winged butterfly like that, or one like this? So these, um, in, in a little bit, we'll be looking at a model of how do you kind of step-by-step -step draw a butterfly like this. But it starts from just sort of looking at, if I were to superimpose a triangle over this butterfly, what would it be a, a wide triangle like this? Would it be a shallow one like this? What would that be for your butterfly? Right, so can you see the, the triangle in the butterfly? Yeah. Right, so if you can see that, if you can visualize this and go, ah, you have much of your work done for you. Right? So that triangle cut off on the bottom, very useful trick. And we'll kind of do a step-by-step -step on that in a moment. Butterflies, butterflies. There's one really cool last butterfly that I do want to mention. Once you kind of start looking at butterflies, you'll start to find these things everywhere, and they will confuse you because you're saying, is that a butterfly or a moth? And they're these little guys here. Right. It's kind of this hybrid. It's actually a butterfly, but... Um, the antenna have these cool little hooks on the tips. See that? And they often have very mothy colors, ochres and browns and things like that. They fly during the day, and you say, well, what is its posture when it lands? So the moths have their wings down like this. The butterflies have them up behind their back like this. These things will hold their wings back at a 45 degree angle. So they kind of go right there in the middle, hit the side, all right? And so when you look at them from the front, you know, there's this little critter sitting there, and, and its wings are kind of tilted up like this. Like, whoa, what's up with that? Oh, it's a skipper. So those are the skippers. I love the little skippers. Start looking around. You're going to run into skippers anywhere. You never knew these things existed, and then you discover, oh, they're absolutely everywhere. Another thing that we get into with uh, the uh, drawing butterflies is the caterpillars. And there's a caterpillar formula. All right? they, some have all sorts of cool spikes and hooks and horns and all these other sorts of things on them. And, um, but what's going on underneath that is actually pretty straightforward. And you can put all that ornamentation onto um, any caterpillar. Typically, you've got a head, a thorax, and an abdomen on a caterpillar. So we've got a head, hard head. I have one, two, three segments that are my thorax. And then the rest, next ten, are my abdomen. And those thorax ones, that's where my legs are. I have jointed, regular, hard insect legs there. On some of the abdominal ones, there aren't true legs. So these things called prolegs, these little fleshy stumps that come down with hooks on the end that help them hold on to things. But these have formal leg legs. Some of these back here will, in the, the caterpillar will have these little pegs. And typically, you'll find this pattern. Head, three legs, a space, four legs, a space, and the back leg. All right? And sometimes a few of these back segments here get a little bit fused together. So the number of visible segments that you'll see between this back leg and here, that can change. 
right? But this general pattern, expect to see, people, the, what I want to get, help people kind of get away from is I'm going to draw my caterpillar. <laughs> right? So, I have head, thorax, abdomen. And so, head, legs, space, four legs, space, one leg. Except there's one little group of moth caterpillars, one family of moths that do things in a different way. And these guys, by the way, when they, when they walk, they do this. They kind of go, they kind of ripple along. But there are others that do this extreme, right, where they stretch out, come all the way up, arch their backs, and then forward. Those are the inchworms, right? Inchworms have these first three pro legs here are gone on inchworms. So they just have legs at the front and the back. And what happens is people will see this cool thing and they love this motion of the inchworm. Right? And so they say, I want to draw my caterpillar in an action pose. They put it in inchworm position and then draw monarch patterns over that. Oh no, right? This inchworm action goes with one group of moths, right? Everybody else is going to be doing something much closer to this up here. So um, here is inchworm action. Here are some examples of other caterpillars. And they have all sorts of ornamentation, but you see the head, one, two, three, space, one, two, three, four, space, another foot at the back. Our next group are the ants, bees, and wasps. People often easily see the, the connection between bees and wasps because they sting me. Why are ants in there? Well, just take wings and stick them on the back of an ant, and they look a lot like a wasp. Ants also, some ants have a very powerful sting. Right. Um, so the, um, in tricks for drawing this group, um, oh, this is kind of fun. In the, their, their name, uh, it means membrane winged. So hymen means a membrane. Terra means um, winged. So it's a membrane winged thing. Four membranous wings. Two big wings, two small wings. A lot of the wasps have a very thin connection um, between the abdomen and the thorax. And in this group, you also see this, the coxa uh, and the trochanter as being big, long, expanded things. So it gives the leg this extra joint that it looks like. In this, you can see on the foot here, look at this, how on the, the tarsus, you're going long, then a little bit shorter, then a little bit shorter, then a little bit shorter. Last one has the hooks on it. I love what these guys do with their legs in, in flight. Very often, but you'll see the wasps going, the, they're flying around with the bottom legs dangling around behind them. It's a very, very distinctive thing. And you can safely watch most um, wasps going about doing their things. They just leave yellow jackets alone. They've got a real attitude. Um, but most of you, like if you see wasps all over a little flowering bush or something, just get your nose in there and watch what everybody's doing. They'll be like, oh, hi, we're just kind of pollinating. We're doing our things. And you can watch them. They've got great patterns on them. Wonderful, bright, clear patterns. Sometimes it's neat with ones with bold warning coloration. Don't mess with me. Some of them have long egg-laying tubes, ovipositors on the back. So you see these ones with... Um, Long um, egg layers back there. That's a good question. I think that is correct, but I should check into that. My first, my gut answer is yes, but I need to. I should double check. Something that is cool is the ones. I understand that the ones with the really long ovipositor. I don't think they can sting you. Um, the stinger is a modified ovipositor. Look at this. Does this look like that ski jumper? 
love it. This, so when you see these things going around, like follow them around. Like I once spent this wonderful afternoon kind of uh, what are the flight postures of different insects. And I, could, I would follow them around the meadow like this and then make little sketches. And you can come up with all of these great postures that nobody's looking at. Um, journaling is a great way of getting yourself curious about those little wonderful elements. We mentioned the flies as one of this big, this big group. So flies, let's look at the name, Diptera. Di means two. Two wings. So in these, they have the primordial insect had four wings. These, the back wings have just been reduced to little tiny stubs. So they've got four wings. I mean, two wings. Um, very often the antennae are just small little nubs with a hair sticking out of it. Sometimes they're a little bit longer. Um, here's some examples of flies you may know. Some of them come to you. Some of them have spectacular colors. Um, the, I love hoverflies. There's this big group of flies that mimic wasps. They look very waspy. But you can, you're hiking down a trail and you see them in the sunbeam ahead of you. You can actually tell by their behavior before you get up to them that they're hoverflies and not wasps. Because you ever, what, you've, you've seen this before. You're walking down the trail and you see in front of you, you, you see... That's the action of the hoverfly. Came to a tragic end. Uh, um, another neat one. Uh, we've seen these guys come to your house in the evening, right? Um, you see them sometimes coming to lights. Um, these are crane flies. And on these ones, get up close to them. They cannot bite you. They cannot sting you. Perfectly safe. And, um, by the way, they, they also don't eat mosquitoes. Um, I know, isn't that a bummer? But the, uh, someone said, don't crush that because it'll eat mosquitoes. If I tell you that they don't eat mosquitoes, still don't crush them. <laughs> they're pollinators, right? They're eating plant nectar and dew. They're sweet little ones out there. And they're just having a great time. And, but get up close and look behind them. You can actually see the vestigial wings, the little stubs of those old wings sticking up behind there. These things actually spiral like this in flight as little gyroscopes to help the thing keep its balance in flight. Yes? Um, if, those, those little, um, then where are all six legs? Okay, so the, the, so these, uh, on this drawing here, I didn't put in the legs because I just wanted to, um, people, I wanted to have a kind of a quick drawing to help people look at the, sort of the shape of the tip of the abdomen of this thing. Um, so I simplified that drawing. So that's just an illustration where I trimmed the wings, didn't draw on the legs. All righty. Another big group, very primitive one. We find fossil uh, dragonflies that predate dinosaurs. It's really, really cool. Um, there are the dragons and the damsels. And the dragonflies... These are the ones that their wings will, at rest, will always be stuck out to the sides like the letter T. The damselflies have more delicate, thin bodies, and their wings can fold up gracefully behind their back. They're much smaller. All right, but you'll find both around um, ponds and pools and marshes, huge, huge eyes that wrap around the whole front of the face. Um, the structure of the wing on these also bears a little bit of attention. Expect to see this curve, especially in the front edge of the wing. Then there's a vein that comes behind that. Right at that curve, there's a little supporting cross piece. The vein continues off here. And there's a little dark spot off on the tip of the wing called the stigmata. So this pattern you're going to see all over these guys' these guys wings. Very, very common. So look for that little angle change. Don't just get out there and say, ah, there's my wing. Look, you, see, you often will see this little bump. 
in the leading edge of those critters' wings. You see it right there on this damselfly as well, the little stigmata. All four wings have a stigmata on them. All the sort of, you'll see these four little spots right back here. So are these damsels or dragons? Good. Beautiful colors. Um, can I hold up your little book? Your dragonfly book? Um, this, this one here, this is a wonderful... Um, Kathy Biggs has done fantastic stuff to get people to start to appreciate and love uh, dragonflies. Get her book. Really, really, really good stuff. Very, very easy to use. Very, very clear, perfect photographs and very clear descriptions of what are the marks that uh, you want to look for to be able to identify things. That's it. Do they, Kathy Biggs, is that B-I-G-G-S? Yeah. Yes, terrific book. Um, on dragonflies, don't just focus on, I'd say less important than what are all those cool little spots doing. Start, this is a great place to get yourself to step into looking at insect behavior. Watch what they do, how they interact. You'll see them patrolling territories, going back and forth, you know, protecting a patch of turf so that I'm the only one that can mate here, chasing other ones away. When they're mating, you'll see the males holding the females behind the head, and they'll float around the pond together until they'll, they'll, she'll take the tip of her abdomen and hold that to um, the, the, uh, the base of, the, the, of his abdomen here in thorax, and they make a little heart. They'll fly around together making this little heart. Really, really cool stuff. Um, so s how do they lay their eggs? Some will go down and just dip their tail in the water. Others will land and place the tail in. So these are fantastic places to get yourself to start to look at insect behavior. You can do that with any other species. Butterflies too. Butterflies patrol territories. They'll chase each other. They have all these cool things that they do. But usually we don't think of insects doing really interesting things. Because most of what we do with insects is just go shoo it away. Right, and this helps you kind of branch out and kind of appreciate that more. In flight, you won't really see the legs. The legs will fold up underneath the body. And then they, they're flying around. They're looking for insects in the air. And then they take their legs and they drop them down like a basket and can catch other insects in the air. So you sometimes see them around. And, oh, just got an insect up there. Um, so again, you don't really see those, those legs. When they go to perch, those legs fold down And so you have three sizes of legs, small, medium, and large. And see how they, they fold down, making an L, medium and large. And so a small, medium, a small, medium, and large there. And so expect to see that. That um, really kind of helps you kind of understand and demystify what you're seeing there. That's not too bad. We can handle that. There's, there's that femur, tibia, and tarsus right there. Our next big group is the grasshoppers. And look at how you really don't see the, the coxa and the trochanter here. You just see those three big leg sections, right? Orthoptera, meaning straight wings. They've got one big, uh, two, two, uh, two pairs of straight wings on the back. And um, these grasshoppers, as they grow, you know how the caterpillar goes, the, turns into the chrysalis and then into the butterfly? They go through this, what's called complete metamorphosis, this total system overhaul every, as they change. Grasshoppers, as they grow up, they start off looking like a little grasshopper with no wings. They shed their skin. They look like a little bit of a bigger grasshopper with little tiny wings. They shed their skin again. They look like an even bigger grasshopper with even bigger wings. So each time they shed their skins, their wings get longer and longer and longer until you finally get ones that are adult size. So you can look at a grasshopper and say, are you a youngster or are you an adult? Grasshoppers have short antenna and crickets have long ones. Is that a grasshopper or a cricket? No, yeah, so this cricket, we call it a Jerusalem cricket or a potato bug. Potato bug, a lot of things end up getting called a potato bug. Wonderful little cricket. So much fun to draw these things. We'll get into getting these textures in just a moment. 
one last group. This is the group that probably we are the least initially familiar with, but get this one under your belt too. Um, I think they kind of ran out of good names, like, you know, half-winged, that makes sense, the hemiptera. Um, but uh, diptera, that made sense. This one, homo, homoptera, it's same wing, so there's like, oh yeah, these two wings here are the same, like, yeah, as the other one, like, on all the rest of the insects. Okay. Um, but, um, so on our, on our homoptera here, um, these, you typically find the wings forming a little tent over the back of the, uh, the insect when you look at it from the front. Um, and the... The, we have plant bugs, I mean the plant hoppers, we have tree hoppers, we also have cicadas. So the plant hoppers, the one you're probably the most familiar with is the spittle bug. That's the nymph stage of this little plant hopper. The adults are these little brown things that when you kind of get your finger too near them, they go and they jump away. They're, they've got these huge spring-loaded back legs that they jump very, very far away. Um, plant hoppers don't have quite as big jumping legs. The plant hoppers often have better camouflage, things that make them look like little thorns. Find these in oaks and in other bushes. And finally, the cicadas are a really neat group. Cicadas, um, those are those ones that you hear singing. And if you live on the East Coast, you're like, yes, I know cicadas. Um, they spend most of their time underground. And they crawl out, split their skin open, and this critter comes out and sings, male sings to attract a female. They've got a little membrane that vibrates on the side of their body. Um, really, really cool critters. Wings making a little tent over the back of the body. Um, yes. Um, yep, yeah, so this would be, you're, you're right. So we've got um, a big coxa and trochanter right there on this one and then femur, tibia, tarsus. So usually that coxa trochanter doesn't really come into play and confuse us. Here it does. One thing I noticed about um, drawing the insect lens is that the knee of the insect, which I guess would be between the tibia and the femur, is where the skinny parts meet. And at the, I don't know, what hip and ankle, I don't know, at the other end, they're fatter, but they're skinny at the knee. Oh, so you're saying that? Oh, so you're you're saying that it is going to go big to small, and then small to big. Yeah. That's that's a great observation. Just on on most that I've Look at, I'd say on this wing tip, if I've got there's an area with sort of. Uh, barring at the tip of it, and then another spot here. It would be easy to look at this as one shape. Now I'm going to draw this thing as the next shape. But if I'm focused on the shape of this, I might not get this distance between these two to be correct. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw this shape. Then I might draw the shape of the white between these. I'm going to look at that as my actual shape. So I'm looking at what is this shape. Then my brain flips over. And I say, now what is the shape of this box in here? And I get the same thing, all right? But I'm just getting myself to kind of leapfrog across. So I'm actually looking at this as a shape here. This white space between these two things is a shape. Maybe my butterfly flies away here. If it's a buckeye, all it's done is just gone about 20 feet down the trail and it landed again in the middle of my path. So I'll go up and get it again. Or maybe I'm going to see it later on that hike. If I don't see it ever again, I can make little notes that these were red bars. There are some blue-purple spots here with dark edges. You can add written notes in here to supplement these. You don't have to finish any drawing. If the butterfly is really cooperative, great. I can work this out in even more detail. This is kind of fun on the fabric of the wing here. I first made a set of lines coming down this way, and then another set kind of curving across those. Kind of gives a little suggestion of, 
of um, the uh, scaliness that's in there. Um, in here, I'm giving a little suggestion of the hairiness next month, how to do hairiness. But I like to do watercolor. On insects, something that I really, really like to do is what's called mixed media, which is just a fancy word for um, putting together um, graphite pencil and watercolor and colored pencil, anything that you can use to kind of get the effects that you want. You don't have to be a purist in everything. So I'm going to do that on this. If, if you want to, you can color your critters in. Uh, with watercolor, I usually start with some of the lighter colors. Here are the oranges and the pale browns and the tans. And then I add in the darker colors after that. It's always possible to go darker with watercolors. It's hard to go the other direction. So if you start with your things with dark, sometimes you're like, ooh, I wish that wasn't there. So often watercolors will start with the light stuff and work their way into the darker sorts of things. This would be where I would stop with a watercolor drawing. But if I want to turn this into more of a mixed media sort of thing, then I'm going to get a black pen and maybe outline some of these spots and get a, one of the things I keep in my nature uh, sketching kit. I don't have a big set of colored pencils. I've got just a few select colored pencils, but one of them is this sharp bra dark brown colored pencil. And I'm going to get that, add a little bit of texture in here. Sometimes there's sort of a hair-like scales up in this part of a wing. Give a suggestion of that. And as I'm kind of going out in the wing, I'm going to go with a pencil, suggesting a little bit of the texture of the um, on the wing of the butterfly. Yes. What is this butterfly called? This one's called a buckeye. A buckeye butterfly. Thank you. Putting in the black pen on here really pops these. It just overall adds more contrast to the drawing. If I could do that if I had a super steady hand with the tip of my brush, but I don't. So I'm just like, ah, oh, this is the time for my pen. And then I can do the other wing at my convenience if I choose to. Or I don't have to. I've got a lot of half-drawn butterflies <laughs> all over my sketchbook. Another thing that you can do with a, in a sketchbook is you're hiking along, you find a dead butterfly. Um, you can sketch it from that dead butterfly that won't fly away. Then you can pick it up, pick off the wing, or pick it off the grill of a Mack truck at a truck stop, and just get some of that big uh, packing tape and tape it into your journal. You can put all sorts of cool things into your journal that way. Right. So that is the end of our butterfly workshop. And I've got just enough time to introduce you to how to do three different textures. All right. Um, perhaps, perhaps before we do that, um, I, I want to stop and find out if there are any questions that people have so far. Yes? I have a, not a, I don't know question, but maybe something you can clarify. is the shape of the connecting part of the bottom wing on a lot of insects tends to be sometimes drawn wider than it should be. Like it should be where it connects is thin, but sometimes people just draw it like it's just this big wide thing that goes over mm. towards the, the thorax. Great. I'm just wondering if you can kind of comment or sketch a little bit like how the bottom, I, I'm seeing my butterfly looking exactly like that and it's just wrong, where um, maybe it's more like a dragonfly. So yeah, on this one, this is going to connect in here. There is sort of a rounded part in there that, that does come in. Remember those slides that just had the, the whole um, uh, the whole wing yeah. up there. There were those, those rounded ends in there. Um, I'd say one of the, the best things to do is when you do find a dead insect is just to let yourself sit down, sketch it, and then it's okay to sort of take it apart. See, how does this actually insert? Um, I understand that David Sibley, will, when he's studying birds, he will sit there, he finds a dead bird, and he uh, sits down, gets out a pair of tweezers, 
pulls off this feather, and then this feather, and then this one, and then this one, for this entire feather tract. And he looks at how each one comes in. And then goes to the next feather tract, and feather by feather by feather, pulls those out. And looks at, and he's discovered all sorts of crazy things about how feathers actually connect into bodies. People didn't know. Because he's willing to kind of like, let's take this thing apart and sort of see what's going on here. Be a great study to do on insects as well. But not the ones that are alive. So let's take a look at these three kind of surface textures. You want to make something look rounded but dull, rounded but shiny, or iridescent. Right? Um, don't be afraid. You can do this. All right? um, and it's, it's once you kind of learn that there are, oh, though, that's the trick that's making that look that way. That's the trick over there. You can really, really easily do this yourself. And I'll be sort of surprised at how fast you can make your clitter, your critter glossy and smooth, um, shiny or dull, just by changing a few variables in how you are applying your shades and shadows and highlights. So let's, we're going to start with this one and then go to this one and then go to this one. I want to point out the sort of number one thing about what shadows do that people miss. You probably have seen the little diagrams like this before, maybe this exact one if you've taken some of my other workshops, where light falls on something. On the side closest to the light, we have the highlight. On the side farthest from the light, we have a shadow. Okay, yeah, but I knew that. So here's the, here's the, here's the nice little kind of sweet point. It's the reflected light, and that's what people miss. That's what's going to really round out your object. If this is on a surface, and other light is striking that surface, some of the light from this will bounce back off the ground and illuminate the dark back edge of this object. So this is light that is coming, bouncing off the ground here and back out, and then striking this right here. That's the reflected light. It's not going to be as bright as this. This is subtle, but it's a big deal. And you put that into your drawings, and you're like, like ooh, I like that. Right? Um, the, um, we're going to apply that idea on this beetle. And what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to imagine that the sunlight is kind of coming from over in this direction. cone arrow up here. Oh, by the way, little sort of sideline about cone arrows. These are really kind of useful things in your notes when you want to sort of show that something is kind of, that these are sort of flying in from this direction, or this is coming in from this direction. If I've got something that is coming from where I am out into the plane of my paper, I would do a cone arrow the other way. So you can very easily sort of change the directions of cone arrows and suggest um, different directions of things in, in your field notes. So I find myself, you know, I'm sort of showing wind direction. Those are very useful. Sunlight direction, those are very, very useful in my, my drawings. So if the light's coming from there, there are surfaces up here that are going to get more light. There are ones down here that are going to get be more in darkness, where this sort of rolls around the side. The ones, the surfaces that are most directly facing where the light is coming from are going to be the brightest. And there might be a little bit of reflected light on the furthest edges. So what I'll do with my watercolor very often is first just paint in my shadows. This will be a brown insect. I'm going to paint in my my shadows with watercolor. I do the shadows first. And here I haven't really put in the reflected light because I'm going to do that towards the end with just a little bit of colored pencil. I'm going to cheat. Right. So here are these surfaces that are closer to the light, lighter up here. And then I have, here's the, the important thing, a gradual change from lighter getting darker, 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 darker into here. Lighter, darker, 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 darker into there. I have a gradual change. Now, 
I am going to overpaint this entire thing once it's dry. Thank you so much for coming. I'm going to paint, overpaint this entire thing once it's dry with brown paint. All right. So I've already got my shadows in. Because watercolor is transparent, when I put this stuff in, you can still see those shadows underneath it. I let that dry. And then here's a really neat thing you can do with watercolor. If you're using heavier paper, it doesn't really work very well on our standard sketchbook paper, but heavy paper like watercolor paper, it can take a lot of abuse and rubbing. And one of the things that you can do is, if I have something like this, I can get, take my brush and put some water back into this part here, up into here, maybe up into here or here. Those parts that I want to be a little bit lighter, if I re-wet them, I can then take a little paper towel or a little tissue or sometimes just a clean brush, a damp brush, and dap it into there. And you can actually sponge out some of the color that you've put on. Most people don't think you can do this with watercolor because we're working on just our, you can't really do it on the regular sketchbook paper. A little bit heavier paper, you can get this wet and pull lights back out. Even I pulled in a little um, reflected light out here. That, out of the, this dark, dark, pulled that back out. Not all paints allow you to lift out. Um, so you take some experimenting and getting to know the ones that, that do. I like um, paints that allow you to do this because it's just one more trick in my toolbox and I end up doing this a lot. So others will stain the paper and they're locked in there. But um, a lot of the ones in my palette are ones that, that do this. The one that is the, the, the worst at doing this is Thalo Blue. Right? It's just like, <laughs> I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. All right. But a lot of the ochres and browns, it's just those will, you'll be able to pull those out. Now, in this, I can kind of work for sort of general tones. It's not really detailed. But if I get out now a black pen, I can draw over this and draw in some little details on this. And the little beetle is starting to look a lot more. So if you get those sort of values and colors right, and then you drop your detail in on top of it, if you do the detail first when you're putting in all your colors and stuff, you ruin and obscure your detail. So do the detail at the end. Once you kind of get your values right, and you're like, ah, oh, okay. Now I'm going to drop a little bit of detail in with my black pen. So black pen pushes my dark details. And then I get out my favorite tool, a white Prismacolor pencil. And I'm going to come in here and add in some highlights. Take a look at the effect you get with adding in a little bit of highlight with white Prismacolor pencil. on top of watercolor once the watercolor is dry. So once the paper is bone dry, if it's not dry, all you do is it just sort of pushes into the paper and makes little grooves. But on totally dry, you can put your colored pencil right there on top of it. All right. Oops, not you, you. So without, with. So take a look at some of these little holes here. If I have a hole here, imagine this is a round hole, and the light is coming from this direction. On this side of the hole over here, where the light is, it's going to be in shadow. But on this surface over here, you often will get, in this zone here, the light can strike that side of the hole rather directly. I'll do this with my hands. I don't know if you'll be able to see this from your, your angle. I'm making a cup here with my hands. In the palm of my hands, I've got a shadow. The more kind of gradual that trans, you get where there's a sh that really feels um, uh, shiny. So I took the same drawing, exact same drawing. I erased a whole bunch of the um, colored pencil because colored pencil doesn't sit very well on top of, uh, I mean, a uh, watercolor doesn't stick very well on top of waxy colored pencil. And I wanted to put down some more watercolor, so I erased my colored pencil. And because my paper, I had kind of tough paper, paper was dry, I could do that. So I erased most of that. You see that there's a few little bits of it that still kind of stuck around. The next thing that I did 
is I got a wet brush and blended and blurred some of these edges, making the overall thing darker and these transitions in here just a little bit more subtle. It still looks pretty dull. What? Oh, so, so what I did um, is, from a, between um, the previous step and this one, I first got rid of that white colored pencil, because if I put watercolor over colored pencil, it, the waxiness of that pencil kind of acts as a resist, and the, the stuff doesn't want to stick to it. And I had so much of that all over here, I didn't want it that messing with me. Oh, so this it was a combination of neutral tint and um, Bloodstone Genuine from Daniel Smith. I love Bloodstone Genuine. It's my new, just like <laughs> luscious, dark brown, rich color. All right. So I then hit that with a little so water. Softens those edges. I've got the whole thing darker. Notice that where I had some of those pencil things, those pencil marks really show through. That's because that pencil isn't really letting that um, stuff um, attach in there. But this doesn't look shiny, right? Because there's it's, there's not high contrast in here. This is a fairly sudden transition, but this isn't too much of a value change. So I don't really have the sense of shininess. But I have something that's really dark. Now I'm going to mix up a little bit of white paint called gouache. It's a water-based, like watercolor, but it's 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 more opaque than your regular watercolor. Um, and I mix up a little bit of, of that, and I'm going to apply that white paint on top of here. Is that white paint acrylic? Is that what you're talking about? Oh, no, it's a gouache. It's called gouache. Yeah. And there it is. Without with. And... Do you see how this high contrast, that's starting to look shiny. This part here looks a lot shinier than this. Why does this look shinier than that? Because you're adding more gouache and there's white elements in there. So you see, they've got more gouache here, kind of punching that white in. That's right. So because of this goes to white, 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 white. And this doesn't. This has more contrast. That feels shiny. If I wanted to make this feel shinier back here, if I put mixed up some really thick white paint and just dip, 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 dip onto here, I would get this. All right. So you see how putting that super high contrast in there, pow, that's what does the trick in making this feel shiny. It's that I'm going from I have to be bold enough to put a white spot on this guy's head like that. All right, and just say, I'm now some light. When you're, what you want to think about is your brush with the light is you are the rays of the sun. You are the light source. And you, where are you going to strike? I'm going to hit right here. Bap, right? And I don't want to smoothly blend that in. I just want to go bap, then over to there. Bap, over to there. Bap, 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 bap. The more I do that, you get this wet look. One last thing that I did is I came along, I cleaned up some of my edges, I added in some colored, I'm going to add in some colored pencil to give myself a little bit of the seam between the two parts of the wing covers here. Put in some reflected light with that in here and in here. Notice that this looks fairly flat. This looks fairly flat. A little bit of reflected light subtly with my pencil. Look over here. Reflected light can will reflect in the color of whatever is reflecting off of it. If there's a blue sky, sometimes you get you know even kind of blues coming in. All right. Look at this side of the face here, just dark. A little bit of reflected light comes in. Look at how that forms that face. That's why reflected light. That's your total friend. Just be subtle with it, because at the start you're just going to be putting in. You're like, oh yeah, oh yeah, okay, here I go, here I go, yes, yes. And it's so much fun that you'll bring it to this level of lightness, and it won't look like reflected light.
It has to be seriously stepped back, but it is a major player in rounding out your drawing. Does what I'm doing here make sense? Does anybody have any questions? Here are some insects with various degrees of shininess on them. Right? The sharper the contrast, the, sharp, the more that it feels. Yeah. So what this was, was painted black, put in a light dusting of some white colored pencil, then got out some gouache, painted that in, make a big white spot, bold enough to just put a big white spot, pow, right there in the middle of this thing's back, and then got, let that dry and got a black pen and put a few more divots into that. And then it, those, and some white spots out there, you see those, the white spots in the black, and you see the black spots in the white, and you feel that those are little dots going all the way over it. Um, yes, if I put it in thick enough. But not as well. This was not a heavy coat of colored pencil. Here I had a little bit of a dusting of colored pencil, some gouache in the center of that. Then I got a orangish brown pencil and came in and put some dots in that. Yes? These, these little orange dots, those are done once the gouache is all dry. I'm just coming in there with a pencil, a sharp colored pencil, and putting in those little dots into it. So those were drawn in on top of the gouache. But it looks like holes through that gouache, but I'm really just drawing on top of the gouache. You can draw on top of the gouache once it's all dry. These out here, yeah. that is colored pencil on the surface of the paper. Yeah. This same trick, is this is not just an insect trick. You can use this for drawing whatever it is you want to kind of make look wet and slimy or shiny. I was out in the middle of the redwood forest and I came across parrot mushrooms. Beautiful little parrot mushrooms. Um, near Botano State Park, where the Nature Journal Club will be going at the end of this month. And there are these little parrot mushrooms. And I thought, oh, I want to draw these. And they have wet, slimy, highly reflective caps. This doesn't feel reflective. These feel dull because there's no contrast. But I wanted to sort of do a little demonstration of the effectiveness of just dropping some white gouache on top of your drawing. So out there in the forest, I didn't put that in. I came home, I scanned the drawing that I'd done in the forest, and then I put my gouache on it, and now it looks wet and slimy. Without wet. All right. It's just high contrast, pop that in, and ah, you're good to go. And these little places where that, um, even putting in more of that contrast, the highest intensity, that really, you, know, you feel wet. High contrast. Pop that in. This was a photograph, by the way. Um, the, uh, that feels like um, a... Um, that, that's what makes something feel shiny and reflective. And the last one is how to draw an iridescent beetle. All right? Don't be afraid. All right? Here we just started with the big concept here is gradual change. Here, sudden change, high contrast. What's going to give us this? What will give you, uh, how do you draw an iridescent beetle? All right? Google search. Yeah. All sorts of crazy things come up when you do iridescent beetle Google search. But I did the iridescent beetle, beetle Google, Google search, and I came up with um, this guy. And I thought, ooh, that's, that's cool. That's a neat looking little critter. Now, any photograph that you find on the web, those are the intellectual property of those photographers, right? Um, and it's their copyright. 
And if we, as artists, just grab other people's photographs and copy them, um, and especially if, if you're doing this for your own edification, to give to grandma, these sorts of things to give to friends, um, or to train yourself, that's perfectly fine. If you're going to be selling it, or using it in a book or something like that, you're, you're, you're violating somebody else's copyright. And so what we want to do, if you want to use that, is either change what you draw so much that they're going to look at it and say, that's not my drawing, that's not my photograph, or um, um, I just gave this guy, sent this guy an email. This is Andrew McCorney, um, and he'd done a whole bunch of photographs up on Bug Guide, and I liked his stuff, and I said, can I use that? And he sent me this lovely email back, said, yes, please, please do, that's wonderful. So a lot of people are very, very generous with that. Other people, it's actually how they make their living, right? And um, they say, you know, yes, I would like it if you use that, but can you give me something? They're not being stingy. They're not being mean, right? It's actually, it's their art. And we can, as other artists, we want to respect that and we want to give, uh, support them if we can. Um, so either you decide to use some other drawing or you can also choose to support that, um, that, that photographer or, or illustrator or give them some mad props and when you give a lecture. Thank you, Andrew. Um, the, um, so he let me use this drawing, but let's take a look at what's going on in mean, this photograph. There is beautiful violet and light blue dancing together in here that then goes into black. There's not a big zone of transition, little bit, but there's a lot of on, off. With an iridescent thing, it's going to be reflecting back to you bright, vivid colors, or it's going to be off. So I want these two things, dancing colors, quick transition. Dancing colors, quick transition to not a shade of gray of it, but to black. That's going to feel iridescent. So here's what I did. Um, thank you, Andrew. I put this coat of blue paint on here and danced it in with some purple. I've got the first part, dancing colors. And now I want to go straight to black. I took black paint and just dumped it on top of that. It's a little bit rough in here, but already this is starting, it sort of has a feeling of some iridescence coming out in it. It was a little, so rough that I decided I want to smooth that. I got in here, here with my wet brush again, and I tried to smooth out some of these edges, which I did, but also I found when I did that, I kind of dulled some of my other colors. All right? So I made, smoothed my edges a little bit. Look how in here, I just lifted out some of this. Woo. Lifted out a little bit of color along here. And then I decided I want to make this a little bit more vivid. I took some purples and just painted them back into it. So I realized this was a little bit too pale. I didn't want that kind of going to white shine. I wanted to go to a purple. So I painted some purple back into there. Now I've kind of like the way I've got going quickly to black. I've got these things dancing around. There's no detail on here yet, but I've got a good the, my two things. I'm going to black and I've got my dancing colors. Yes? When you put your dancing colors on in the first place, did you do wet into wet or did you put purple down and then let, or you put blue down and let that dry and then put purple down and let that dry? Both work. Okay. In this case, because I was doing these step by steps, I had to do one coat, let it dry completely, scan it, then do the next coat. But you can also do wet and wet with that. Predictable, but it has more beautiful effects. Yes? Yeah, you, even if you put one color down, let's say you put yellow down and, or, and put some blue over it with watercolor, even though the colors are, are, aren't mixing, because you've got those two layers and they're transparent, people will actually see green through that. Um, if you slosh them around and you get it wet on the surface and they're kinds of colors that will kind of lift out, you also can get some sort of mixing between those. But when you put one color on top of another, you're essentially mixing colors with your watercolor.
Um, one thing that I did to help my blue stay more in place is a bunch of this blue is thalo blue. And that's not doing as much lifting out. Because I'm like, I'm going to take it. You've, you've gotten me so many times before. I'm going to use you now because I know you are. You stay put, right? So now what I'm going to do is I've, I like my colors. I'm going to now think about detail. I don't put the detail in at the start again. I put the detail in towards the end. So here we go. I'm going to get my black pen, put in some of those divots of darkness in the surface here, pop some of those edges, um, define some of the edges of, of these, the, the, the feet here, just sort of coming along with my, my pen, kind of crisping up some of those edges a little bit. The last thing I do, remember how before I got my white colored pencil? I'm going to get a light blue colored pencil and come in and just dance that in. Again, I'm now light striking this thing. What are my big surfaces that I want to pick up with that? I'm going to do those same things with kind of the crescents of the light blue around these little black dots in here. And this is what I get. Notice also what I do with some reflected light. And that's how that drawing was built. I've got dancing colors shift to black, and you get the sense of iridescence. When I was working on my Sierra Nevada book, I didn't know how to draw iridescence. And so as I was kind of going into my drawings, there were kind of a number of stumbles and fumbles. Some of them look iridescent to me. Others, the, some of the first ones I did, it looks bright, but this doesn't look iridescent. So I was trying to do this beautiful iridescent beetle, but this one actually doesn't look iridescent to me. Um, why doesn't this look iridescent? Needs more. It doesn't fade to black. And also, it's either green or it's yellow here, these sort of things. Mike, there's no dancing colors like in here. All right? I'm not, there's no dancing colors, and, and it fades into a gray, which is what you see on sort of dull surface things, as opposed to going to black. Had I gone to black, that would feel iridescent just like that. All right? So you have to be bold, but you can do it. Um, many of the, um, the photographs that you've seen here um, have come from a fellow named Ethan Winning, um, who is a photographer who um, has, he said, I love the stuff that your, your group is doing. Feel free to use my photographs as reference material for um, a lot of the, the, the work that you're doing. Um, you might want to, I'll put a link to Ethan's stuff up on our Facebook site. Um, for your homework, the seven insects, I really recommend just you get yourself a bunch, uh, try just a bunch of you know drawing off the web or from, from books. You don't have to track down insects in the field for these. This is just getting yourself familiar with these textures, some of the structures, some of the wacky things these insects do. It'll be a little bit easier to start with things that aren't going to fly away halfway through your drawing. All right. You can do this, give it a try, and see what happens when you start paying a little bit more attention to insects, you're going to find them everywhere. The most, single most important thing you can do is to try to figure out a way that you can get yourself sketching on a more regular basis. If you are doing it once a week, can you get it to three times a week? If you're doing it three times a week, can you get it to five? Right? The more that this becomes something you do, the easier it will be for you to do it again and again and again and again and again. So thank you all for coming. I hope that this was valuable. Keep those sketchbooks out and have fun in nature. Thank you.